All right, so here we go, video one of two. Um, and this one is Ewan building the AEA6. Um, the point about this, as I said, is the fact that obviously I've built quite a few of these chassis, but these are the cheaper end of chassis that you can buy. Um, so if you were thinking about buying one for Christmas or for a younger person to get into the hobby, how easy is it for them to be able to build it? So let's have a look in the box. What's in the box? Bags. Bags. That's it. Start and look and get your instructions. Start finding out what you've got to do. First job, got to build those bits. We've laid out bag A. He's on it. Handy little tip, we use the box lid to empty all the little bags out with the super tiny springs and little bits. I have to say for a young person already, there's a lot of very small bits. And I'm going to have to teach him how to use a knife to cut off the little spurs to make things neat as well. So that's the next job. So you always cut down to the table, look, and then turn it over. And then just slot the little other spur off to make it neat. So that little boy there is a flanged lock nut rather than normal. Look, it's got a flange on it, look, so it's got a flat bit. And then that grips and locks up. So you've now got to use your two mil... This. Yeah, your 2mm Allen head and the spanner, who is the 6mm side, to put two of those in there, it says. Yeah. you got to identify which holes. It's the second hole and the fourth hole. So. Second hole, <laughs> fourth hole. Yeah, it's fiddly, isn't it? That's it, and then get the 6mm Allen head, the spanner, put it on it and spin the one in your other hand. Spin this one now. Get it nice and snug. Righty tighty, mate. That's what I was doing. <laughs> you weren't, you go to the left. You gotta go to the right. That's the left, you know, the right. <laughs> Righty tighty, let's go. Right, so to avoid putting all these ones on there, because they're gonna fall off really easily, let's put those three standoffs on. So, three standoffs, same kit, same thing, you gotta get them in the right holes. These ones. Sweet. Yeah, you've got this. Just keep going. Yeah, so it probably is a bit easier, as long as you don't let the pliers slip, so give him a good grip. So opting for the pliers, he thinks is better. One tip I've said about this is you can put um, something like a hair bobble on here or a decent elastic band, just to hold stuff when you're moving around, because it's quite easy to drop stuff, especially when it's a younger pair of hands putting it together. So next step, we've got the 5.8 mil ball stud and the two mil washer, and it's got to go on the other end of there. So you can start it off gently, and then there's a two mil Allen in the end there, so you can use the spanner again. That's not two mil spanner. Oh, oh screwdriver. Push and twist, push and twist. Seems so next bit, we've got to do these little stack of O-rings. So follow the list. So next bit is to put the two arms together at the front. So we've got spaces to go between the two again. So it's a two mil. Allen to put them together and those two little spaces have got to go on. So it's probably a plier's job again to hold the spacer while you wind the piece in. And Fidget around with it. You probably get each one started off first. Get them all started so it's like loosely together and then just hold with the pliers and then do all the nuts up. For sale, one LP86 built by a professional. Real professional. A real professional. This apparently is the faster method. It is. Because you push down with one hand and spin with the other. And get this one done. So we just got push bearings into the hubs and tighten on the ball studs as per the little picture. And then put in the axles. It's fiddly, you're gonna need the two milli again. Yeah, I might just do the bearings first. Yeah, generally just put them on the table and push them in. Are they quite easy or they're quite hard to go in? Quite easy, they just slide in. Oh, that's easy then. Sweet. Yeah. And then pop your axles in. Stub axles. Yeah, 
yeah. my need that. I drop everything. Make sure you get the right way around. You thought around. Yeah, it's bottom. So that's one done. And then you just gotta put in the big ball still on the end. I find it easier to put that on the end of there first mm. and then just put it in and push down against the table. So next up, after fitting the stub axles, you've got to put the drive pins in and the hexes. So the hex has a little slot in the back that the pin fits into. Yes. So the pin just goes through the little hole in the stub axle and then you slide the bit over the top. Yeah, if you put the pin horizontally so it doesn't fall out mm. and then get it centre. So put the pin in first. Well, no, because I put in the pin in second and that works. Cause... And then make sure it's horizontal to the table. Like that, and then put your hex on. Your head pin's got to be central for the hex to clip in. There we go. There we go. You've done those. Found that quite annoying though. I've just started and put the e clip onto here. So I did that by using a pair of pliers and just popping it in the pair of pliers in the jaws there and just giving it a gentle squeeze. I think that's definitely something that an adult would need to help someone with. Um, the box was super helpful because even I dropped it a couple of times. Um, to stop stuff from running away. So we're now putting the pins in at the front here. The stub axle or the uh, knuckle goes on top and then this teeny weeny little spring fits on top of the knuckle. So you've got to slide that onto that pin, dude. It's really tight. It's a really tight fit, is it? <laughs> So tiny e-clip on top, look. Very careful. Clip it in. Give it a gentle squeeze. Pop. And it's in. Oh, is it? Mm, not sure. I don't think I did it enough. No! <laughs> Failure. Take two. And then I'll be like Batman. First time. There you go. Slightly stranger this time. It seems really loose. But it's on. And uh, obviously, first time. Tribulations of Eclipse. The trials and tribulations of Eclipse. So my friend Kev says he fits Eclipse onto um, oh. <laughs> onto off-road cars um, when he's out racing and on fields so over grass and stuff. And they put the Eclipse in a small little plastic bag and then squeeze it on. Then I think tear the plastic bag off. You've turned it. Uh, it's on. No, it's not. No, it's not. I've, I've <laughs> there it goes again. Just shaped it. Trials and tribulations of Eclipse, uh, all done. Next page then, we've got to tighten up this front suspension piece. The triangular bit goes towards the back, which is how we've got it on the arm. So I think it is two row rings on the back, one on the front. What's the difference between clear and not clear? Uh, how hard they are, I believe. So the clear are a bit squidgier, I think. So if you don't have any... Um, Spanners. Obviously, I've got these spanners for things, but obviously, it's a lot easier to use a wheel nut tool to do the ones when you can get to them on the end. Much, much easier. Especially when it's a locking nut. So, the standard amount of wobble on the front here says that the front nut should be flush and the second nut should have two mil like clearance. Is that two mil? So, he is just like two Eyeballing his space. We could get a ruler, couldn't we? So we just picked out the M3 washers and bolts and just fitted the servo up inside there so we can begin to build it. It goes that way around with the cable forwards on the Rev D1. And that goes on those pillars, obviously, in the right place when he gets that far. Yeah, He's just going to screw that up. Little servo bolts going in. So we've got to get the springs on the servo saver. So one of those has got to go on there. So you've got to get that to fit on there. Properly. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it's a bit snoog. Is that one on? Yes. And then you've got to get this one to go over the top of that one. What? Yeah. And it won't want to do it. See, so then you're going to have to use something like, I've got some round nose pliers here for you to put inside it. And just pull it and pull them apart, pull it apart. So put it on top of there, I'm and then do it now. No, <laughs> you have to pull it, you have to spring it apart. So put the pliers inside like that, 
and push them in the opposite direction. So pull them apart so it, get, it makes it bigger. Watch your fingers and then push it over the top of there. Can't do it. Yeah, it's quite hard. Again, I think we're finding some definite things here which adults need to help with. On. We discovered the way forward is to push it down against the table so the back's on. Illustrate with the pliers what we did, dude. Then you go in at the front there in the gap in the spring and then just pull them apart and push down against the table and it pops straight on. What a genius little move. Just popping in the top of the servo horn. Everything's too. Building the little horn for the end of the servo piece. It's already tightened. Yeah, just nip it up and move on to the next one. There's not much thread on that. Just putting together the end of the servo horn using a spanner because it's on the servo. I reckon this bit would have been easier not on the servo. Got a fair bit to go there, dude. Yeah. There you go. So that is uh, the servo assembled and we just popped the two M8 bolts in there. So I would say that's about an hour in so far. Definitely, you know, 12 year old lad definitely needed help with the Eclipse on the end there, they were a pain. Definitely needed help with the servo bits on there. But left to his own devices, I think he could have got 90% of that far. So uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting concept. The reason I think this is because out of all the chassis at the moment, um, you know, although the D-like is kind of more for, I suppose slightly more advanced drivers who like the idea of a retro kind of non-suspension floppy chassis that handles like an old uh, A86, but um, at the same time, it's one of the cheapest chassis on the market. So if you wanted to get someone into it, and a lot of people are running brush motors, uh, GPSCs and things like that, the, what I've got bought for this is um, a 21 turn, um, 20 quid ESC, a motor combo coming. So it's going to be a real cheap setup, 110 quid chassis, 20 quid motor and ESC. Yes, I've got a RevD servo and it'll have a Yokomo V4 which together is about 100 quid if you shop on things like Bonsai Hobby, um, because you need to be able to steer properly and you need a good gyro that's going to be able to do the job for you rather than struggle with bad gyro motor combo, no, bad gyro servo combo. So I definitely think it's worth spending the money there. And then obviously you could get away with a cheap receiver to begin with, but I'd say realistically minimum of a Sandro MX-6 um, to make a cheap car. But um, the beginnings of a cheap car, and we'll see where we get to tomorrow. So today is shock day, and we're building the rear shock. So again, I helped him out with the Eclipse, but you've got to start gathering all the bits in the picture, dude. So that bit, you need that bit, you need the bit that bit. Ring on the bottom. Yeah, it has a bit of bounce back, just because we built it fully open. So on the damper front, we just built the damper. We did mess it up a little bit. Interestingly, it has this extra little shock guide. Sorry, I got mixed up between this top piece of the piston and the shock guide. So as we built it up, I built it like a normal damper I've built on every other RC car and did not realize that I needed to go in there. But what that does is lock into this funny little lumped bottom piece here and creates the seal. So once we built it, it obviously didn't seal and it leaked everywhere. Yeah. It is a proper cheap, like the cheapest design of damper I've seen. That's definitely worth knowing. But um, I guess that's the idea of the car. Super simple. Right, we carry on. Next what he's got to do is make up the little poles for the steering arms, the tie rods. And one cool thing that I kept from building uh, a Sakura D4, was my first chassis I built, um, is keeping one of these things, which is super good for putting your ball joints in the end of to help you turn them, which makes it easier, especially for young people. There you go, look, super easy with the big key. It's got a cup in the end. You've got to put the ball was, in the cup. I was putting it in the cup. <laughs> Do you want me to hold it still for you? Yeah. It's so putting it in the cup. Okay. That was easier. That's a bit. So what we are finding is the plastics on this are quite tight. So we're currently just doing this little rod here for the it's not going shell. In. It's not going in. It's got to put more pressure on, dude. Don't put pressure on. And it's hard. Especially for a young person. So I think we're discovering that the D-like is definitely not kid build friendly. Yeah, a bit easier if you hold it yourself, isn't it? Yeah. Really do have to go far on. 
Yeah, it's, it's tough, though, isn't it? It's tough threading into plastics. So we're back. We're on bag C, and we are making the kind of rear section of the chassis because uh, the rear section obviously twists compared to the front section of the chassis. So uh, we're building this bit. What you got to do? Oh, you got to cut the little foam pad. To cut two them. times ten mil ten times ten millimeters of foam pad. And place it in the T-bar where shown with double-sided tape. Oh. Not included. Oh, well, that's handy. It's a good thing I've got, yeah, it's a good thing I've got some double-sided tape. Lots Most of the time they supply these things with tape attached to them. Like sticky-backed. Not for T-bar CDs. Humbug. Right. By the magic of video, we better get some double-sided tape. No, we lied. We don't have any. So, we're going to build the gearbox and then go buy some and finish that bit off later. So this piece is the piece that joins to the shock. So it's like the shock tower, so to speak, is all the half. So that connector there, look, mm. connect onto there when you finish that. Going well, I think this bit is more achievable. Yeah, I think definitely. this is more fun. Just like building a box. Yeah. So we just started to put the gearbox together, got the shaft to build in that order, little spacer tube and things. And again, we're using a handy little box so we don't lose anything. And a piece of paper towel for all these. I'm guessing we've got to use the um, grease. Ooh, flying ball. That is that. Got to use the grease to uh, grease up the bearings. That's first side assembled. Not really. Just got to screw in that kind of long grub screw shaft. It's quite cool, that. So it locks the hex in place. Another pair of hands required on that bit. Yeah. So we've begun assembling this bit. You've got the um, diff housing. Then you've got this funky shaped shim. Then you've got a bearing. We've now got to put all the little balls into the spur gear and put some grease on those. It's going to be hard to do, I'm going to have to help him, and then that uh, rest of those little parts there that are listed there can go on. Oh, that's, that's it, grease the ball up, and then dunk the ball in the hole. Yeah. No, not that hole! You didn't look at the picture! Look at how they're arranged! <laughs> Which hole have you just put it in? Right, poke it out. So we have found one mistake in the instructions. When you look at this diagram here, this second two and a half millimetre ball bearing here, it says goes on after the balls, and then that, and then that. But if you put both of those ball bearings inside there, then it doesn't fit together. Basically, the whole assembly doesn't go together tight. When actually, that ball bearing wants to go inside that one there, which then goes inside that one there, and then it all assembles correctly when you put it onto there. Aha! Tucked in amongst the instructions, was a correction page which shows that that ball bearing was in fact in the wrong place and it's the two and a half on that side and the three and a half on that side so now we've got to just swap around the bearings and get them in the right place and carry on assembling. Woohoo! Last bit to do is to just assemble the um, wheel hex so three bolts go. Go go go! Oh. So we got the double-sided tape and we stuck on the foam bits. However, we did it slightly differently. We put the foam sticky tape, the double-sided tape on the whole block and stuck it to the actual rocker arm because we thought we had a bit more tape on it that way. It does the same job. And that one side. And that is ready to build up the next bit, which is rear body posts. More bits arrived, the uh, Surpass 21T motor. And I got it off this 91 mod guy off eBay who does these motor um, ESC combos. And it was just like 22 quid, I think, posted for that whole thing. Which is the whole point about the chassis is doing stuff um, on the cheap and having it more like a retro car. You're just putting the post together. 
Butter tray's got loads of fiddly bits with the little M3 nuts on the trays. But it's coming together. Nice little spaces. A few of my friends who built these before they even built it went through the instruction manual and measured up all these spaces to buy nice alley posh ones. And theirs look proper cool. Right, here's a picture of one. So we're just doing the bottom four last bolts up, and I think this might be it. This might be it. The rear tires open, yeah. So we're just popping on some buzz brakes. Trying to. Trying to pop on some buzz brakes, aren't we? Yeah, trying to. So there you go, we just chucked on the SC. We've got one well long wire, this all needs tidying up. That's my V4 that'll go in the other car, receiver. And that should be ready to go. We just need to put some batteries in the controller and we'll give it a test. There you go, so that's a quick test. It does seem to have a bit of a wobble on from the gyro, so whether I've got the gyro stuck down well enough or just movement in here, is just flipping the gyro out. I need me to turn the sensitivity down something, but it's working perfectly and um, drives really well. Um, pretty impressed out of the box. Next job then is to take it down the track uh, and see how it compares to the, let's turn that noise off. See how it compares to the DSD-1. Obviously the DSD-1 is going to have a, a, a different motor and different ESC in, so I'm not really going to be comparing that. It's more about how they drive um, and whether you can make the DSD-1 wobble like this. We'll see that this wobbles properly when we've got the shell and stuff on it. Um, because I wonder that if I just mod the DSD-1 a little bit, I can make a really nice full alley cool chassis while also doing what this one does. But also it's a comparison of whether if you buy a 100 pound chassis, um, you can have fun with it. Because I think these are great and these can be really good fun. I think the DSD one can do the same, but not have the kind of, the sort of fashion of the wobbliness to it.